Hi, everyone, and welcome to another LINK webinar. We really appreciate you guys uh, sharing part of your day with us today. Uh, my name is Margo Newcomb. I am one of the directors of marketing for Teledyne Marine. Uh, and today we've got a great topic. It's actually the first in a two-part series on uh, 2D, uh, BlueView 2D training. So this one today is going to be an introduction to our ProViewer software. Uh, our trainers that you can see on either side of me here are going to be uh, John Robertson and Tyler Whitaker. So uh, a little bit about our presenters today to give you a little more detail. So John Robertson, for those of you that don't know him, and I have a feeling a lot of people online probably know John and Tyler, but uh, John Robertson is our customer service manager for the Americas. Uh, he's worked with Teledyne since 2008, and he had originally started out at Blueview. John manages the US-based support team, which is responsible for all after-sales service, support, and training for Teledyne's full line of imaging products. So busy guy. Tyler Whitaker has uh, joined Blueview back in 2012 and has held many roles through the years with responsibilities including technical support, customer training, pre and post sales application support and product demos. Currently, Tyler's role is an applications engineer for Teledyne's Marine Group. So Tyler works for John and uh, these two are kept incredibly busy being out on the road. Uh, well, previously being out on the road, now we are just saying how little we've all been traveling around right now. Uh, but they are your first line of support after you have an imaging product. Uh, if you're in the Americas, these are your guys that are going to be um, supporting your efforts. So I do just want to quickly launch a poll here. Uh, we just want to try and get a feel for people's experience levels. And so I'm going to launch this right now. So while I'm going through some housekeeping items here, if everyone could um, just weigh in, that would uh, be really helpful. I, people always ask, so I just want to let people know this is recorded and you will get a copy of the recorded presentation uh, probably within the next 24 hours in an email that we send out to you guys. So uh, don't worry if you need to hop off early or if you want to share it, that will be available. Um, also, everyone is muted because we did have a, a lot of registrations for today's um, session. So I do hope that everyone shows up, uh, but to keep everything uh, as easy and flowing as uh, we did put everybody in, in muted state. Uh, however, we do want to hear from you. We want this to be interactive. So um, you'll notice that there is a place where you can type in questions. And we definitely encourage you guys to do that as we go along here. And uh, at the end, uh, John and Tyler will be happy to run through all of those questions and get you guys some answers. So I'm just going to close out this poll. So. Tyler and John, I don't know if you can see this or not, but it looks like we've got a number of people with no experience or beginners, which that's great. You can walk them through all of this here. Uh, so I am going to hand this off to Tyler now and everyone um, enjoy your session. Okay. Well, thanks, thanks so much, Margo. Margo. Uh, John, did you wanna go ahead before with anything? Uh, no, yeah, thanks, Margo, for the introduction. Um, yeah, we'll uh, we'll just jump right into it uh, to to conserve our time with introdu further introductions. So Tyler is uh, going to uh, present through the material, and I'll jump in as uh, an added bonus presenter. <laughs> so uh, Tyler, go ahead and uh, take it away from here. Great, thanks, John and Margo. Um, as Margo mentioned, uh, I've been with Blueview for almost nine years now. Um, so the first of these series is really kind of a good foundation for using the sonar in general. So it's good that a lot of you are beginners because I'm going to kind of cater this from a, a beginner's aspect. So i um, really going to go over the software, primarily a few other things that are important to understand when using the software. Um, next week, we actually have a little more of a deployment considerations, a little more of the hardware side of things, uh, if you are interested in that definitely uh, sign up, uh, attend next week. Uh, but for today, we're just gonna basically go over the uh, the ProViewer software. So general overview of what we'll go over today, um, just talking about the ProViewer software at a top level. Um, then we're gonna go into software setup, bench testing, uh, both very important things, uh, IP address configuration, uh, going over the user interface, going over some of the software settings, uh, the important ones, uh, and then we're going to run through some data examples, just kind of show you how to do the playback with the software and the tools you can use. 
Um, and then, of course, the all-important Q&A. Uh, you guys can ask any and all questions you'd like, and we'll, we'll do our best to answer them. Um, yeah, so and as, here, as we go through the material, please uh, go ahead and type in your questions uh, as, as they come up so you remember them. And we'll, uh, we'll, we'll start picking them up at the end of the uh, end of the call. Absolutely. Uh, so ProVR software, you know, what is it? So Blueview's 2D imaging sonar um, has ProVR as its primary acquisition and recording software. So this is the main piece of software. Uh, it's it's free software. You can download it. You can email us, and we'll send you a link for free. Um, if you don't own a sonar and you want to just play back some data, we're happy to send over the software and some data sets for free. Um, but ProVR is the primary software which will connect to the sonar via, again, network, and will record the data and then, of course, play back the data. Um, so it's kind of an all-in-one software package, uh, very turnkey, very intuitive to use um, for running the 2D, Blueview 2D imaging software, um, which see here interfaces to the Blueview sonar. It also interfaces to uh, pan and tilt devices, uh, NMEA devices, like uh, if you have antennas for positioning and heading, that will also be able to come into ProViewer and get recorded along with the data. Um, last note here, it is Windows only. So uh, some people may have Linux environments. Uh, ProViewer itself is Windows only. We do have a, a software development kit we offer that can be used on Linux based systems. You can ask about that or we can give details on that later, but ProViewer itself is Windows only software. Um, so setup and bench tests. Uh, this is critically important um, for us and for the end user uh, to do a benchtop bench top test setup before deployment um, every time you deploy. So this is basically serves as a software and hardware functionality test. Um, when we chip a sonar, when we sell a sonar, we, we always include these four components. Of course, the sonar, cable, PoE box, Ethernet cable. Um, the cable's typically like a 25 foot shorter cable. So uh, generally before getting in the water, before putting the sonar on the vehicle, we wanna connect it in this bench test setup, you know, on the bench, uh, out of the water, if you want, and just connecting it to the computer, making sure, you're talking to the sonar, making sure the software launches properly, and making sure you have a a sonar wedge, albeit it may not have actual imagery in it because you're out of the water, but you'll actually have a wedge there. Um, so very important test setup. Another good reason for this is if if you have an issue with your sonar connection or otherwise imagery issue, the first thing we will do as Blueview support will basically ask you to put it in this bench top test setup. This will allow us to isolate any issues with the sonar um, that aren't related to the vehicle or your own deployment. It just isolates the sonar so we can really troubleshoot the sonar. Um, so you'll you'll hear us mention this if you ever reach out, reach out to us for troubleshooting, which hopefully you don't have to, but you never know. Um, the software itself, just like any other Windows software, uh, it just basically runs a setup, installs it, maybe takes 30 seconds uh, to run through the setup um, and then you're good to go. Uh, minimum requirements are over here. Again, pretty basic Windows requirement. Um, we have here the, the 10 gigabytes more of disk space. Uh, this can be larger. Basically the, the recorded .son data, which is what we call our data files, uh, can be quite large. They're, they are raw sonar data. So generally having a large hard external hard drive or internal you know it's cheap nowadays uh, generally having something like that is recommended just because the data files can get quite large um, really quick uh, this is kind of very important to actually connecting to the sonar again it's a network device um, so you, you do have to set up your windows to talk to the sonar device uh, through a static ip address um, this is kind of buried in your, not buried, it's it's in your network settings in Windows. Um, I can, maybe if we have time later, show you where this is in, in my computer, but just to save time on this, um, you basically go into your network settings, go to your adapter settings, and then specify, use the following IP address, and then uh, you're going to enter the following. 
Um, the reason we use this kind of IP address is because by default from the factory, the sonar has a 192.168.1.45 IP address. Um, you can change that, I'll go into that a bit later, but by default, that's what comes with from the factory. So assuming you don't change the IP address, this is the set, these are the settings you, you will use. Um, so again, I can, I'll, I'll show a bit more on that if we have time, but I do wanna get into the software um, quicker. So I'm gonna exit the PowerPoint here and jump over to the software. I, I do have a number of slides, but because it's a software um, training, there's no point in going over PowerPoint slides when I can just show the software, of course. So, so the software, ProVR 4, here's the main splash screen. Um, I am connected to a live sonar. I can't show you the setup, but it, you can picture it exactly like that bench test setup um, I had a few slides ago. Um, so right off the bat, we have just a few buttons. Uh, the main one being, of course, connect to sonar. Um, the others being open recorded file, if you have a, a pre-recorded file, and then settings, which we'll go into in a moment. So powered up the sonar, um, gave it you know a minute and a half to boot up. It does take time to boot up, so don't don't rush it. If you power on the sonar and 10 seconds later you're not connecting, there's not a problem. Just give it some time um, and connect. Here we are. We have a we have a full sonar wedge. Of course, no data because it's sitting on a bench. Um, but that's essentially the bench test setup. We have a working sonar, we have a connection, um, you know, we, we have our wedge uh, and now we're ready to go in the water. <clears throat> um, so there are a few basic kind of interface things I wanna go over. Uh, I know we're not seeing much, but I will get into some interesting data sets. So bear with me through the, the, the blank data, um, but just to kind of go over what we're looking at here. Um, this is the main user interface, the main UI, I guess. Um, this is the actual sonar wedge, of course. Uh, in the upper right, we have a few details, uh, the name, the model. In this case, it's the same. This is our M900-130, one of our, our very common sonars. Uh, serial number, firmware version, uh, and temperature. That's internal temperature, so that's not there's no external temperature sensor on the sonar, that's internal. Uh, the reason that's there is kind of for us from a troubleshooting standpoint, um, there is kind of a throttling uh, action on the sonar if it does get too warm. If you're in very warm or hot water, the sonar can overheat. What happens if it gets too warm? In fact, if it gets to 67 degrees Celsius, it's going to start slowing down the ping rate to try to cool the sonar down. Um, so. If you're seeing slow ping rate, maybe disconnects, and you're looking up here and you're seeing 67, 70, 75 degrees Celsius, you're probably running too hot. Uh, you can reach out to us. We can try to uh, address it or, or otherwise find a, a solution to get you back up and running. But um, that's what temperature is for. So good to keep that in mind. Lower right here, we just have ping number. Uh, you know, we're pinging constantly as we speak, uh, and it's just counting up the pings. We have a date time and a ping rate, which is actually quite important. Uh, so we're pinging two and a half times per second. Uh, ping is of course tied to range. Um, so right now we're at about 90 meters range. At 90 meters, we can ping two and a half times per second. Uh, this is limited by physics, right? So the signal, the acoustic signal has to travel 90 meters and come back. So we have to wait for that return signal before we can ping again and uh, send out another ping. So with that in mind, if I decrease this 10 meters, now we're pinging 15, 20 times per second because we only have to travel 10 meters, right? So um, generally good thing to keep in mind, only keep your range keep your range as low as possible to get what you're trying to to image, right? If you're trying to image something that might be at 60 meters, don't try to put it right at 60 meters to get your ping rate you know, as high as possible, maybe keep it at 75, just so you have some wiggle room. Um, very application dependent though. So aside from that, uh, as I'm playing with over here, this is the range slider. Uh, this changes the range of the sonar. So in this particular case with the 900 kilohertz sonar, we have range up to 100 meters. 
Um, depending on your sonar model, it could be different. The, the 450 kilohertz is 300 meters. Um, the 2250 high frequency head is only 10 meters. So um, that will determine what your range slider looks like. Um, we do have, of course, our, our main icons up here. Uh, you know, fairly simple. Again, we try to make the software very intuitive. So um, we try to keep the fewest amount of buttons as possible still giving you power and functionality in the software. So uh, I'll just run through these. The disconnect from sonar, this is the same button I clicked initially to connect to the sonar. Uh, we can now use it to disconnect. Uh, open a pre-recorded file. Uh, we have settings, which I will do a deep dive on here in just a second. Uh, measurement tool, uh, we'll be using this when we go over some pre-recorded data sets. It's just a simple point-to-point -point measurement. We have a zoom button. Um, also can be done with the scroll wheel, if you do have a scroll wheel on your mouse. Um, that's how I use it. I never click this. I generally just use my scroll wheel. Um, rotate, to rotate the wedge. Uh, we'll be showing an example of this a little later as to when you would use this, but um, for now, just know it's there. Um, I'm not going to be spending too much time on this Apex broadcast. If you do have questions on it, um, you can let us know, but it's not generally used for for most 2D imaging applications. Um, freeze image, so if you're connected to a live sonar, you can pause it. If you see something interesting, you wanna take a measurement or a screenshot, a live screenshot maybe, you can pause. Unpausing will pick it right back up. Um, export, so we can export screenshots, videos, uh, we can snip, we can make subsets of the .son data to make a smaller data sets. If you have a large data set, you wanna kind of edit it and cut it down, you can you can do a subset. Um, we'll be playing around with these in just a bit with some of the pre-recorded data. And then last and probably most important is the record button. So without the record button, we don't have really anything, right? We don't have any, any data to go off of. So always, always make sure you're recording um, if that's part of your application, which for most people it is. Uh, show an example of that. When I click, it highlights. We can actually see recording here. Uh, it's nice. It actually gives you a file size as it's growing. Um, this is in megabytes, so um, you can already see these files can get quite large. I've been recording for 10 seconds, and we're at 20 megabytes. Um, so good sanity check to see, okay, we have a red recording up here. We're highlighted. We are recording right now. Uh, when you want to stop, just click record pops up uh, a Windows Explorer menu and you can basically just save the .son file. Um, by default, it does have a timestamp. So you can you know, type your name in there and click save. And now you have your, your saved data file. Um, so one thing to add on recording files is when <clears throat> when uh, you are recording, if you uh, if you adjust the max range setting, the file will be recorded with that uh, adjustment in it. So if you start recording at 100 meters and reduce it down to 50 meters, um, the the software will record that change. So it'll be recorded down to the 50 meters, and then if you bring it back up to 100 it will have that uh, displayed in, a, in the recording as well. So that's one thing to keep in mind is to, um, if you are recording, uh, to set the range to the best uh, setting up front and then record, just record the whole window uh, from there. Yeah, that's a very good point. And to kind of add on to that, uh, our dual frequency head called our M900-2250, uh, probably our most common head nowadays. Uh, it has two heads, it's dual head. Um, if you're recording and you switch one head to the other, it actually does record that switch. In fact, with our latest software, it records both 2250 and 900 files. Um, so you, in your .son recorded file, you'll have access to both heads um, in that recording, which is nice. So after, after the fact, when you're playing back data, you can actually switch heads between the two um, and you'll have both, both heads data available to you. So. Um, good to know when you are recording with the dual head, you are recording, in fact, both heads, regardless of which one you're actively looking at. Um, so settings. So there's a good amount here. I'm going to just go over it. Uh, 
briefly, just so we can get to other stuff in, in our time frame here. Uh, we did on purpose try to only show what's what's really I think necessary. Um, basic settings. We do have this advanced settings option uh, because this is kind of a bit more of an in-depth training. I will definitely jump into the advanced settings here, but just know without the advanced settings, um, we really try to show people just the basics of what they need for for operation. Um, again, we try to make this these sonars and the software turnkey to where you can plug it in, put it in the water, you're good. A lot of things are set by default to be the, the optimal settings for most applications. Um, but of course, there's infinite number of uses for these sonars. So <laughs> um, it's good to know how to access kind of some of the more advanced settings to change them if you need to. So we'll just go ahead and click that. Go back to the application tab. So you can see there's a, quite a few more settings here. Um, display ones are, are straightforward. You can disable the, the grid here. You can you know disable the labels if you want. I've never done it. Um, few other options there's there's various filters applied we, we generally recommend keeping on things like the smoothing filter but feel free to play around with these it kind of you might have your own preferences um file size this uh, and, the, and the display the dis sorry to interrupt you the display yeah. section um, that is all items that can be uh, turned on or off after the fact as well so in a recording you can adjust these. It's not uh, a physical change, like Tyler will talk about the physical uh, items that you can change in a minute. But um, these things will not affect any of the recorded data, whether they're on or off while you're recording. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a very good point. Um, file size, so as mentioned a couple times now, the files can get quite large. Um, so this maximum file size, what it means, it's, it's 10,000 megabytes by default, which is 10 gigabytes. Um, so this means every, if you're, if you're recording for three hours straight or more, um, you're obviously, you're obviously going to get over 10 gigabytes. What it does when it hits that threshold is it stops that file and it creates a new one. So instead of having a 200 gigabyte one file for a three hour recording, you have multiple 10 gigabyte files. So it kind of splits it up. We, we really recommend keeping this, or at least having some limit here, so you just don't have one giant file. Um, so the default works pretty well for that. Um, a couple sonar display settings. Um, you can throw up a minimum range slider uh, if you want to kind of window the data in a way. Uh, you can see I, I just bumped up the minimum range, and now, now we're only looking between 25 and 73 meters. Um, some kind of uses for that, very specific uses, but generally it's it's not incredibly common. Um, but you do have that control available. Um, quickly, units, straightforward. We're default by meters, uh, default in meters. Uh, you can, of course, change it to feet. If I do that, you can see all these labels actually update um, to two of the 10th decimal spot. So um, we're up here at 295 feet. Um, I will switch back to meters, but we can switch over to feet here. As well as temperature, you can switch it to Fahrenheit if you want this temperature reading to be in Fahrenheit. Um, there's a couple hotkeys. Uh, honestly, I don't use these that much. Maybe I should, but um, if you do like to use your keyboard and, and not use the mouse as much, there are a few hotkeys that can be useful. Uh, pen and tilt, I don't have right now. Um, fairly straightforward if you have a pen and tilt connected. Uh, the software will automatically find it and it will connect to it and it will display the controls in the lower right here. So you'll have a tilt and a pan control. Um, uh, other than that, you can specify the speed at which it moves, but it's really, there's no other pan and tilt settings. Um, okay, the most important here is probably the sonar tab. Um, this tab will only appear when you're connected to a live sonar, like, like I am. This won't appear if you're playing back data. Um, but there are some things I do want to go over here. So I mentioned before um, IP address. So you can change the IP address of your sonar if you need to. Uh, examples of when you would need to are if you're running on an ROV, you have, a, say, a DVL that's a network device, you have a, you know, cameras that are network devices, and they all operate on their own IP address subnet. So if you all want them to all be on the same kind of IP subnet, 
you might need to change the Blue View sonar to match up with the camera, to match up with the DVL. Um, it's fairly common uh, if they have, you know, our end users have more complicated setups. Um, and it's fine to change it, and this is where you would do it. But if you have no reason to change it, uh, we just recommend keeping it the default, which can be seen right here. Um, so if you do want to change it, you type it in here, click apply, um, you reset the sonar, you now have the new IP address. Uh, on that note, a good a good way to see what IP the active sonar is, is actually in the upper left here. You can see connected to 192.168.1.45. So if, if you're on the phone with us and we ask you, you know, what's the IP of the sonar, the easiest way to find out is connect to it and look up here. Um, okay, hardware. So few hardware settings here. Uh, these actually change hardware and electronic settings on the sonar itself. So some of you probably familiar with gain settings, uh, TVG, time variable gain. Uh, so actually changing these sliders is actually going to change um, the electronics. In this case for gain, change the electronics physically on the sonar, um, change some of the voltages and, and the gains. Um, so if you're finding that your, your data may be blown out or may not be getting exactly the data you want, maybe it's too dim, you can go in here, you can try to play around with these gain settings. Uh, I think first, the best setting to kind of start messing around with if you're not getting the imagery you hope to is this source level. Um, right now it's checked to auto. If I uncheck that, it just gives me a simple slider, 100%, 0%. Um, so source level is, is, put it simply, is just the amount of power going into the water. Um, so if you were, if we were be able to hear the sonar chirp, of course, hundred percent would be much louder than zero percent. So, um, we're not seeing anything reflected again. We're not in the water, but source level is probably the single most important hardware control we have. Um, so again, if you're seeing, if you're in like a pool or you're in a concrete area, or there's a lot of maybe strong or a lot of hard surfaces, you're getting a lot of maybe saturation from, you're getting too strong a return and you can't really get the software to cooperate. Um, go in here and, and turn off auto source level and try, in that example, try dialing down the source level. Um, bring it down to 10% power and your image very likely will clean up. Um, auto on by default is simply tied to range. So max range is max power. Minimum range, you know, as, as you decrease the range, your power is gonna go down. Um, so auto does work well for a lot of uh, applications, but it's it's a good control to know is there. This is how you adjust the power going into the water. Uh, if after adjusting source level, you're still not getting kind of what you want, um, you can try adjusting the gains. Uh, definitely the, these will have an impact on your data. You can actually see uh, even out of the water, our, our gain, the noise is actually getting stronger if I turn up the base gain here. So source level, very useful control. The gains also useful hardware controls. Um, kind of going back to what John said before, something important to understand here, these controls are physical. So when we're in the water, we're collecting data, we adjust the source level to, we max it out, for example. Um, if we're reviewing the data later and we see, oh, we're at max power, I'm getting a lot of oversaturated signal, you can't, you can't revert that, right? It's, a physical, it's physically the signal that you put in the water, so you can't undo what your source level was at after the fact. Um, there's a few settings I'll go over that you can kind of toggle when you're, when you're playing back recorded, pre-recorded data. These settings are hardware settings and therefore cannot be kind of changed after you've you've recorded the data so um, I guess use with caution that being said but also feel free to use it if you think they'll benefit you um, you know practicing with these if you're if you're familiarizing with the sonar practicing with these controls uh, can definitely be a good thing a um, few other things I won't spend too much time on there's a hardware trigger on the sonar um, that you can enable here uh, you, there is kind of a delay. If you want to delay pings, you can basically put, you can basically set the ping rate. So if I have a delay of three, my ping rate will, um, should go up to about three or 
pinging once every three seconds, I guess. Um, so you can kind of manually set a ping right here by delaying it. But again, if you just want it to ping as fast as possible, you can actually just uncheck it uh, and it will ping. Otherwise, that has a default of 0.05 seconds. So it's more or less as fast as possible. Um, so sonar tab, the most important setting here, uh, mainly for these hardware settings and IP address. Uh, the rest here, uh, if you do have a GPS device coming in, this is how you would set it up. Um, Apex, as, as I mentioned, we're not gonna really go into that in this training. Um, probably the second most important tab is the help tab, um, just simply because it has the user manual linked in here. Uh, so everything, Everything I'm saying uh, is covered in detail in the manual. So very good reference. If you wonder, oh, what does that button do? Or what does that setting do? There's likely a very detailed description here in the manual, which uh, easily accessed through the help. Uh, also our support phone numbers, uh, which will give you our direct numbers at the end of this presentation. But if you forget them, uh, you can definitely use these numbers here. Um, okay. So that's kind of a brief overview of, of a live sonar setup. Um, you know, again, we're not in water, but uh, this is bench test setup and all the, the settings you'd see with a live sonar. So let's let's open up some data, get something interesting up here. So all, all I did right now was actually uh, I'll show you guys. Um, I just double clicked on a file here, um, a .son file. This is actually a shortcut, but it's it's just double clicking on a .son file and it pops up in ProViewer here. So I'm gonna pause that. This is a, again, a pre-recorded data set. Before I jump into this, I'm gonna very briefly touch on what I kind of spoke about couple weeks ago in, in the first webinar of this series. Um, it is online. If I don't know, Margo can link to it. There was a kind of basics of Blueview 2D sonar I did a couple weeks ago. Um, we can send you that recording or give you that link. But to kind of rehash some of what I talked about, I do want to, before we jump into the data, just kind of go over what we're looking at when we look at a sonar image. So this is for brand new users, never looked at a 2D imaging sonar. Um, just understanding kind of what you're seeing. So uh, this is just an animation. We have the sonar in this example on a little ROV under a bridge. Uh, we're looking at two bridge footers and a piece of rubble here. Um, so what we're actually seeing is a top-down view, a bird's eye view of, of the actual environment. So we can see the left bridge footer here. It's that one. We can see the rubble in the center, that block. And then we can see just kind of the edge of the the right bridge footer here. So um, it's important and takes some amount of practice and using the sonar to kind of comprehend what you're seeing. You know, when you're pointing the sonar at something, it's not a point of view like it would be with a video camera. Uh, it is this top-down view. So um, just good to keep in mind as we go over these data sets, as you plug in the sonar and throw it in the water, good to know uh, what, what you're looking at here. Again, there's more details on this in my last webinar. There's gonna be more talk about this next week in, in my deployment considerations webinar. So uh, you can stay tuned for that next week, but just a brief overview of these. Um, and then there's things like shadows, just like with light, we have acoustic shadows behind the bridge footer, behind the piece of rubble. Um, there's, there's brighter sections which show stronger returns, dimmer show uh, weaker returns. So um, just very, quick little intro on interpreting sonar imagery. So um, back into the playback though, we have a data set of a bridge, I believe. Um, let's see. Yeah, so it does get interesting in a moment here, but there is just like you would for a video file, there is kind of a playback bar at the bottom. Uh, this wasn't on the live sonar because it was live and not a playback file. Um, but we can actually move the slider to position it at different points in the file. We can play, we can rewind, fast forward. Um, in this case, I'm gonna fast forward till we see the bridge here. This is a lot of, a lot of nothing. There we go. Okay, I'm gonna pause it. 
So we're coming up on a bridge footer here. Um, I do want to show a very important setting here, um, which is called, is aptly named our right click menu. So um, if you right click anywhere on the wedge, uh, you get this menu that pops up. So um, this is one of the most important functions, I think, of ProViewer. So um, if anything, this is an important takeaway from this this whole thing is, is knowing what's that this right click menu exists and how to use it. Um, first thing that appears is a sound speed. Uh, it is sonar. If you're familiar with sonar, sound uh, speed of sound in water is quite important. Uh, less important for a 2D imaging sonar than like a traditional multi-beam bathymetric sonar if you're imaging the seabed. Um, but it, it's still somewhat important. Um, you don't have to worry about it too much when you're collecting data. You can change it after the fact like I'm doing right now. Uh, if you don't have a sound velocity probe, that's fine. If you have a water temperature, you can very easily calculate. There's calculators online you can use to calculate sound speed. Um, you can just plug in the temperature and, and get it in a ballpark, but it doesn't have to be perfect. Again, you can just kind of get it with within maybe 10 meters per second. Uh, also depends on how what you're using it for. If you're using it for very accurate measurements, you do want your sound speed to be more dialed in. Um, if you're just using it for maybe inspection of a bridge footer, uh, it doesn't need to be as exact. So uh, color map, there's a few different color maps. Uh, defaults copper, we have kind of a black and white, we have a bluer one, uh, green, hot, and uh, probably the most interesting one, jet. Oops. So it's kind of a heat map where the stronger returns, let's move up to the bridge footer here, the stronger returns are going to be warmer and the weaker returns are going to be cooler. So we can see the bridge footer here, it's, it's raw, it's concrete, right? So it has a strong acoustic return. Um, same with kind of the, the sandbags and the rocks down here. Uh, we're getting a strong return, so you can see that in red, whereas the seafloor, which is, you know, might be silt or might be sand, it's absorbing more of the signal, so it's giving a weaker return, um, which is why it's kind of colored in blue. So um, pretty interesting for some applications. Uh, copper is most people's preferences just because it's the default. Um, so I'll just go back to that one. Uh, so auto intensity. Um, it's checkmarked by default. Uh, what this is, let me just uncheck it, move this over here. So intensity in ProViewer is, is basically how the pixels are represented on the screen. This isn't hardware settings, this isn't gain, or this isn't power at source level. This is actually changing literally just the pixels on your screen. So uh, this can be done during live sonar acquisition, it can be done after the fact. Um, there's no kind of consequence to changing these on the fly or changing them afterwards uh, because again, it's just pixels. It's just very much on the software side, not on the hardware side. So uh, that being said, very powerful tool. Um, auto intensity is essentially you giving the wheel to the software and saying, you look at what I'm looking at and adjust the pixel settings based on what I'm looking at. And the software does a pretty good job adjusting maybe the brightness, the gamma, to kind of make your images as, as look as good as possible. Of course, it being software, it's not flawless, um, and having the, a human eye is always ultimately the most powerful tool. Um, so if you find, for example, you're getting, again, too blown out of an image, you're getting just not a pretty image, the very first thing I recommend trying is right-click menu, disabling auto intensity. Um, and start start moving these sliders. Um, I would start with the intensity slider. Um, you can already see if we're up here at 96 decibel, uh, we're very blown out. If I dial this down just a bit, um, we're getting a little more of a clear image. It's less blown out. So um, very useful intensity uh, sensitivity. If I change this, you can kind of see the impact it has. It kind of blacks out all the weaker returns and really highlights the stronger returns. Um, and then there's gamma, which kind of brings up the overall brightness level. Um, there are very detailed descriptions of these three 
items in the manual. I'm not going to go over them now because they're not particularly exciting, but um, just know that these controls are here um, and they are very useful. There's something I use almost all the time uh, when I'm looking at 2D data. In fact, I usually have auto intensity off just because I like to have control. Um, but usually during acquisition, when I'm actually recording data, I'm worried about, you know, we're worried about where the, the vessel's headed or we're worried about making sure the sonar is at the right angle. So I just have auto intensity on knowing that after the fact, I can change it uh, and maybe re-record the file, create a subset of video with, with optimized intensity settings. Um, so that's, that's probably the highlight of this, this right click menu here. Um, so let me just, keep playing this um, one, one yeah. second so before uh before we move on to respect everybody's time we're uh, running over about 10 minutes on the presentation portion of this so if anybody has questions please uh go ahead and type them in now um and we'll, we'll show you a couple other things the measurement and the zoom in features and uh, play this uh, data set through a little more but if uh, if there are any questions, please go ahead and type them in now. We'll uh, we'll, we'll address those as we're uh, as we're wrapping up the uh, the presentation uh, re data review. Yep. Yeah. And uh, yeah, we just have just going to finish up this data set. I have one more I, I want to show you, and then we'll, we'll kind of jump into Q and A. So um, as John mentioned, uh, the measurement tool I mentioned before, I just paused it here. Uh, we can actually see if I zoom in using my scroll wheel, we can see these. The front of the bridge footer, we can see these. I think there's sandbags piled up, uh, and then there's a concrete mattress. You can kind of see the the details of it here. So, if I were to pause it, again, simple measurement tool. It brings up a little crosshair. Um, I can click, draws a dotted line. You guys might be able to see that, and it just gives me a point-to-point -point measurement. 2.6 meters. That's how big that sandbag is. 2.7. Um, you know, we can measure the length of the, the bridge if we had it all in the image. Um, you can also see just by default, the crosshair has a range and a bearing. So this point is 13.7 meters at 10.5 degrees um, bearing. So also can be pretty useful for locating locating things. So let me zoom out. Um, the subset, or sorry, export function uh, is straightforward. Screenshot, it'll bring up uh, a Windows Explorer to save a JPEG. Simple enough. It's just going to screenshot what you're currently looking at. Uh, video, uh, also quite useful. It exports uh, .avi. This is useful if you want to email the data set and you don't want to send someone a 10 gigabyte data set and the software to play back the data. You can send them just a video file. Um, it's not going to be as high resolution, nearly as high resolution as the raw data, but it's much easier to kind of distribute to to get the point across. Um, to create a, a video, nice, yeah. And a nice thing about the the ProViewer software and the .som files, if you do create a subset, you can just send a copy of the software over to the client um, that that's requesting it. And then the nice thing about that, they can play back the subset of the uh, the recorded file and do all the adjustments that we were just talking about, the intensity, change the range setting, uh, make their own subsets, screenshots as they want as well. So it's it's a nice uh, nice tool and feature. Yeah. yeah, it is. And and again, that software is free, so you can definitely send it to whoever. Um, you know, as me being an engineer, I generally always like to have the raw data. Uh, the video is good if you want to make a PowerPoint, if you want to have a quick email to to some higher ups or whoever else with the short video uh, that's where it's useful but um, both subset and video uh, both work off kind of these uh, what we call these markers you see down here in the playback we have two markers two kind of diamond markers um, so you could basically bracket the section of data you want to export as a video or as a subset so very quick example um, I did have a lot of, I guess, not so useful data at the beginning here. It was a lot of blank seabed, not much, not much. So the bridge doesn't come into view until ping, we'll say ping 300 here. So what I want to do is just say, okay, well, let's start from about 285 and let's go to 
you know, ping 900, we'll say. So we're really cutting down the data set here. Um, if I go to export subset um, and click save, it's going to save a new .son file. That's just these pings, not any of the, the pings up here and not any of the, the pings at the end of the file, just the ones in between. So that's gonna cut down your file size, really only highlight what you wanna see, which is the bridge. Um, and the video is the same. It's just going to create a, a video file between those two markers. So um, that's Tyler. We've got a couple questions in. Uh, if, yeah. if you're through with the export, uh, so one question is about IP address. If you do, if if the IP address was changed on the sonar, and you do not know what it was uh, changed to, is there a way to uh, to find out what it is? Uh, yeah, that's a very Good question. That kind of gets into Windows networking in general. Usually, if you're not sure, the best thing to do is to, I could just show you quickly. So the network settings in Windows, like I showed you before in the, in the PowerPoint slide, uh, you can actually access them if you go down to your taskbar. You can click on your, your network connection, open network and internet settings. You can also type this in the search bar. Uh, change adapter options. Again, some of you may be familiar with how to do this. Um, it's useful for a lot of things, not just Blueview. Um, you find your actual network card. Uh, I have a lot here, but that's just my computer. Um, but you find, generally you'll just have one ethernet port. You find the one that you're plugged into. You go to properties. You go to internet protocol version four, double click it. Okay, we're at the screen that you guys saw before. So I have mine set to static because I know my IP address and I know it's 192.168.1.45. Um, if you don't know it, generally the best thing to do is have Windows try to find it. So click obtain automatically, um, reboot the sonar, make sure it's still plugged into your computer, give it maybe two, three minutes to boot up. Windows will basically search for the IP address and try to find the IP. Um, it does a pretty good job um, most of the time. Uh, you know, you might have to reboot it a couple times to give Windows a better chance. Um, so if you're not sure what it is, obtain automatically, boot it up, give it three minutes or so, and then go into ProView or try to connect. Hopefully it will find the IP address. Once it connects, you'll see in the upper left, you'll see connected to, and it will say whatever the IP address is. Make sure you write that down um, and put it on a sticky note and put it on the sonar or go into settings and change the IP back to the default. Um, so yeah, obtain automatically. If that doesn't work, um, we have to get a bit more advanced. Usually we use a tool called Wireshark. It's a free tool that kind of monitors network traffic and you can you can see what network traffic's coming into the computer and you can just kind of deduce which one is the sonar. Um, so if you're not comfortable with that, just reach out to us. We can uh, we can remote into your computer or we can give you descriptions of how to use that tool to find the IP address. But first, first step is definitely this obtain automatically um, and see if Windows can find it. So it's a very good question. Another uh, another question is about uh, pan and tilt integration. Um, so asking if we currently work with, what what manufacturers do we integrate with? Um, currently, uh, we only integrate into the ProView so ProViewer software with the ROS pan and tilt. So that's uh, that's the only system that we integrate in the controls into uh, the ProViewer software. Um, however, you can install the sonar onto any pan and tilt and operate it separately. We just won't have the controls in the ProViewer software or the feedback from that pan and tilt uh, for, for any heading changes or position changes. Um, and to that one quickly. And then on, <clears throat> we've got one more. Uh, can you explain, show how to uh, integrate uh, or uh, connect to a, a dual head? I'm assuming uh, that that question is regards to a dual frequency uh, sonar. Um, if if not, then uh, oh, please please uh, correct me. But if uh, if it's a dual frequency sonar, 
uh, the connecting process will be exactly the same as uh, Tyler showed with the bench test uh, uh, for for this single frequency. Uh, you'll have a a tool in the toolbar by the uh, if you can put your cursor on that, Tyler. The the toolbar on the top left. Uh, there will be a button over there to switch between the two heads. So uh, there's a 900 kilohertz and a uh, 2.25 megahertz. Um, so you'll have that option to switch back and forth uh, real time. Right. Oh yeah, I can't get, I don't have a dual head here, unfortunately, but yeah, it will basically just have a little drop down that says, do you want the 900 or the 2250 kilohertz head? Um, so it's nothing too complex. Um, it's all just, just basically an extra button up here in the toolbar. Um, and one last question that we have in so far is about the sound speed setting. Um, is there a is there a way uh, to know that it's good enough um, for for you know general navigation, uh, general use? If you're not using it as a tool that that um, you know you you are are really needing the most accurate measurements in the using the sonar data. Um, uh, so. I don't know if you have any data, Tyler, that you can show uh, how, how we use the sonar wedge to um, adjust the sound speed. Yeah, um, let me see. I can do it with this data set. Let me see if I have a better one. Let's try this one. OK, so this is a. Uh, Another data set, we're just driving by these big I don't know, concrete footers of some sort. Um, you can actually see the shadows pretty clearly as we're, as we're driving by them. Um, but if I pause it, so we can see the strong return from the concrete footer. Um, if my sound speed was way off, um, so if, let, me, let me simulate it and show you if the sound speed's way off. So you can kind of see what we're doing as the sound speed is, is adjusting. We're actually changing the angles of the sectors to match up with the correct physics of the signal. So you may see, this isn't a great example, but if you see, if you're looking at like a flat wall or structure and your sound speed is way off, you'll see kind of a break, um, kind of a break in the imagery. Um, that is usually a pretty dead giveaway that you're not, you're not a, uh, your sound speed's way off. Let me see if I have a better example. Yeah, really, a really good way to do it would be to either, if you were pointing at a, a very flat wall, a, a flat surface, because then you would really, uh, in the imagery itself, see the difference from sector to sector, and, and, and that that straight line would be would be broken, it, like this, um, and and you adjust the sound speed to where it's it's a straight line and that that's that's the best way to do it um you know visually and that'll get you within a few meters per second yeah yeah so if you if you are unsure you can you know find yeah find a flat wall point the sonar directly at the wall you'll obviously see you'll see the wall here and then just adjust the sound speed to extremes and you'll see the wall kind of split and if you just match up those lines, you know your sound speed's about right. Um, and again, you can do that afterwards, so don't stress about it too much when you're actually acquiring data, um, because you can change that after the fact and kind of export a subset with the correct sound speed. So um, yeah, sorry we don't have a good good data set now without searching for it, but flat wall, point the sonar at the flat wall and, and make sure the wall looks flat in the imagery. And if if uh, uh, if you'd like to have more more details on that or some sample data, we can we can always send you some sample data to to right. review that. Got plenty um, of that. But obviously, the best way to do it, if you're looking for you know, the most accurate measurements, is to use the sound velocity probe and put the exact sound speed into that area. Right. Um, uh, one question in that uh, I'll refer to Tyler. Mm -hmm. um, is there an easy way to uh, change the firmware? If we had a, a firmware update, uh, update, do we um, uh, have a, a way to do that in the field? Yeah, uh, yes, it is quite easy. Um, 
now, you know, we, we've gone through different approaches over the years with, with Clearview. Now it's on a very case by case basis. If you have an issue with the sonar and we know firmware will address the issue, uh, we'll basically send over a little update or it's just a, a little piece of software you run, you just drag in a zip file, click update, you're updated. So very simple to update it in the field. Um, we don't, for example, if you say, oh, is there firmware that will improve my imagery or my sonar? Um, we generally won't send that firmware over because it doesn't really exist. The, the firmware on the Bluevue 2D systems doesn't really affect, won't dramatically affect the imagery or things like that. It's it's more, uh, you know, transducer offset settings and things like that. So it's not really important to update the firmware. If if your sonar is a few years old, updating the firmware is not going to improve the functionality. <laughs> so, um, but if you are having an issue and you reach out to us and we determine firmware, firmware will help or otherwise resolve the issue, then we'll, we'll send you an updater. Or if you don't want to do that, we can remote desktop or team viewer is what we use, um, get in there and actually do it ourselves. Uh, that's a pretty common troubleshooting tool we use as team viewer. Um, and it just allows us to kind of take the wheel and troubleshoot or update the sonar and do whatever we need to do without the end user having to do much on their end. Um, and that just requires internet connection, so. Uh, one more question about sound speed. Um, when we were reviewing the data, if you can uh, do an extreme uh, change in the sound yeah. speed real quick. Um, right. The so um, uh, the gaps that were seen in between sectors uh, is that an indicator of uh, of the wrong sound speed? And that uh, the answer is yes. So um, if you if you do see gaps, or um, if for example, I, I've seen this uh, frequently. If you're in a in a harbor and there's lots of pilings in the in the harbor uh, from docks and stuff, if if you see a target that is uh, that disappears and then comes back between uh, you probably can't see my cursor but uh, Tyler if you can show where a, uh, you would see a, um, a piling disappear in the sector uh, oh, so like between if the sound speeds well yeah yeah if the sound speed is the extreme one way or the other uh, you might see it, it between the, the sectors you might see a target disappear and then come back um, and that's uh, that's an indicator of uh, incorrect sound speed. Yeah, as well. I mean, in general, it's not going to. I mean, we're we're right now we're at fourteen hundred meters per second, which is not a sound speed you'll probably ever be at. That's you know very very cold water, very cold water. Um, so if you're unless you're working in extreme conditions, which is possible, um, you really won't be getting to close to either extreme ever. Um, if you are, it's going to be quite obvious. I mean, having the sound speed off a little bit, having it off by even 20, 30 meters per second, it's not going to impact your data significantly. You're not going to be missing entire areas of the data. You're not going to be, it's just going to, it just might, in this case, in the extreme case, here's actually that break in the wall I was talking about. Um, it would create something like that. It won't, you know, make you miss the wall entirely. It will just kind of uh, make your data slightly off. Uh, in this case, I can just line up the wall with the slider, and we're we're and, now. And as as we're as you can see here, we know we're in a recorded data set, and it's adjustable after the fact as well. So if you are a little bit off, um, and and you're just looking for a good image, and not uh, you know survey grade measurements. Um, you just use a slider bar, uh, but if you are looking for those survey grade measurements, um, you know, make sure you have a sound velocity probe on site so you are getting the best, uh, uh, or, best measurements possible. Or, or, or temperature readings at the very least, at the very least. Um, yeah, so I would stick with the default. It's 1500 meters per second while you're, while you're acquiring. That's like, I don't know, what is that? 65, 70 degree Fahrenheit fresh water. Um, so keep it at that. Uh, or you can just dial it down a bit or a bit higher, um, and you're gonna you're gonna capture everything you're looking at at the sound speed. But if you again, if you do want survey grade, you might need to be a little more exact with that. And uh, a follow up question on that as well is: um, uh, Do we take a sound velocity profile um, 
we, we do not um, typically we would just take the the measured sound speed at the head um, it's not uh, not used the same way as uh, as a bolt beam is used uh, and and typically in the in the data you won't see any effect of uh, of any changes because we're we're typically looking forward and not downward where um, in the vertical water column is where you see a significant um, uh, change in sound speed due to due to temperature and uh, different salinities. So um, yeah, we typically don't uh, don't see that that kind of issue. So um, right. yeah, just a, a single static uh, uh, sound sound velocity. Yeah, if you're coming from the kind of traditional bathymetric multi beam world um, and haven't used an imaging sonar, a 2D imaging sonar, or ours in particular, it's it's very much a simplified operation. Um, you know, sound speed profile curves aren't really needed. Um, it's really a plug and play. Put it in the water, it's an acoustic camera. You're going to be getting a nice image, top-down image of what uh, you're looking at. So that's that's really the benefit of the tool, one of the benefits. Uh, so I think um, we should probably call it, um, and we'll, I, I know you have this uh, last. Uh, can, can, I, I can make it under a minute if you. Uh, okay. I, I, I just, just think it's. Respect it's time, so yeah. go, go ahead and present sure. uh, this example, and we'll we'll do um, uh, review this type of. Um, Deployment in next week's um, next week's webinar as well uh, with with some different examples. So go go ahead, Tyler. Yeah. So this is just a, a again we'll talk about it more next week, but what we call a vertical orientation. So if we take the sonar, which is generally in a horizontal orientation, top down view like we see here, and we we physically rotate the sonar 90 degrees. So now our swath is 130 degrees vertical. Um, we get a completely different view. Uh, we actually get kind of a side in profile view. Um, so I have a file, a vertical orientation file here I just opened up. Um, probably not gonna make a lot of sense to, to a lot of people watching this for the first time, um, but this is where a benefit of the rotate tool comes in. So by default, we're at a sonar up, meaning wedge up setting. Uh, if I go to fixed angle, I can actually manually adjust, I'm just scrolling here, manually adjust the wedge to where I want it. That's very useful for these vertical orientation sets. So I can actually adjust it. So the lake bottoms at the bottom and the surface is at the top of my screen. It makes a lot more sense. And here you can see a bunch of weeds on the bottom. Again, this is this, the seafloor. This is the surface about right here. It's kind of difficult to see the surface, but um, we actually have a bridge coming up here in just a moment. Fast forward, a lot of weeds. Now we're moving. Sea floor getting deeper, getting deeper. Here we go. So we're just kind of driving by these bridge footers. Um, we're we're kind of have the sonar pointed at them a bit. Um, again, go, we're going to go over a lot of these orientation, these data sets next week, um, but really good, really useful tool for looking at vertical structures like bridge footers or pilings or whatever else. Um, but using the rotate tool really helps you make sense of these vertical data sets um, just to position the bottom on the bottom and the surface on the top. Um, heads up here is just a setting. If you do have a pan and tilt and you do heads up, it will basically move the wedge based on your pan angle. That's all that is. So, um, yeah, that's that's it. More more on this vertical orientation stuff next week. Um, but that's that's it for the the pro viewer bit. So that there's endless amounts to go over with this stuff. If you guys have questions, I'm happy to send over data, talk more about it. Um, you can definitely reach out and let me pull up that page. Um, just our contacts here. Um, also, if you've ever emailed us, you'll see those as well. So feel free to jot those down um, and reach out to us whenever.